Right now, it is time to get into food. It's time to bring in Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, once again. Good morning, Arthur. Good morning, and happy Thanksgiving. (laughs) Believe it or not, it's only 10 days away. If you are hosting it, which I am, maybe, I don't know. We we haven't decided what we're going to do around here. Um, Maybe we're going to Philadelphia, or maybe Philadelphia is coming to us. But both Philadelphia and I have decided that we have to find an alternative to cooking it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, anyway, well, now I have to say we not only have two children who will only eat a very small <laughs> group of things, uh, but a father, <laughs> my nephew, who's become semi-vegetarian. So I, in fact, asked him yesterday, what would be your vegetarian... I have to think about that. (laughs) This is his first Thanksgiving he's dealt with it. Anyway, as far as I'm concerned, you can easily be vegetarian on Thanksgiving. Just don't eat the turkey, which is, to me, the least interesting thing about Thanksgiving in any case. But, like my niece... If you need to have that turkey, if only for the uh, symbolism, tradition, I don't know, what other adjectives can we say, Mm -hmm. Um, then by all means. Last year, uh, I ordered a no-dine smoked turkey. It's gorgeous. Sat in the middle of the table. Uh, The few who wanted it ate it. (laughs) <laughs> the rest of us waited until the hash came and the other turkey leftover dishes, which we much prefer. So uh, this year, I don't know, but let me say that 10 days out from the holiday itself, there are a lot of things you can be doing and should be doing if you're hosting and, and making Thanksgiving dinner. Of course, you've got to come up with a menu. Um, I always go for you know what's tried and true in my family, And I was thinking about this all morning. This is still the morning. Uh, And I remember we uh, we never did Thanksgiving uh, at my house. Um, That was one of the holidays that went to my father's sister, Aunt Pauline. She loved to cook. She was a terrific cook. And I'm sure my mother, who was a good enough cook but didn't love to cook, uh, was thrilled that... Uh, Aunt Pauline uh, put up a huge feast. Uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas, those were her two big holidays. Uh, She was married to a Catholic Polish man who wanted to be Jewish, and she was a Jewish woman who wanted to be Polish. Don't ask. Anyway, um, so she celebrated those two. And we had, and I have to say that thinking back, she did this, I'm not sure. I thought, always thought she did this for my father, her brother. But perhaps it was just what they ate when they were younger. I don't think so, though. We always had an enormous bowl of the creamiest, butteriest mashed potatoes. Her dressing um, and stuffing, she had both, meaning some of it went in the bird and some of it went out the bird. Uh, same, same mixture was always the most, uh, that was my favorite thing. I could just have the mashed potatoes <laughs> and stuffing. Okay, a little bit of cranberry sauce, because you need the tart. I still like the cranberry sauce for the tart. Um, and by the way, in my family, we had a no longer around, but person who had to have uh, a, a, a jellied cranberry sauce. It wasn't Thanksgiving unless she had that. So we always had that on the table, too. I like it, actually. So those things are are, are a big memory, but my father also was a devotee of chocolate pudding. So my aunt would make for dessert just a big bowl of chocolate pudding for my father, (laughs) who would, because it was a holiday and nobody screamed at him not to do this, uh, would pour heavy cream over it. You know, and it falls into the cracks on the top of the chocolate pudding. And then you take your spoon and you get it in a little deeper. It's really a good combination. These days, I wouldn't do that, but 
I have done, and we, and and I don't know what we're doing about Thanksgiving yet. You know, not cooking, but mm, I love a chocolate pudding pie. In fact, we have a bakery here in Park Slope that isn't all that good on everything. You know, but one of the best things is they do have very good chocolate pudding pie. Nothing more than a pastry crust, or for me, it could even be a graham cracker crust. Chocolate pudding easy enough to do on top of the stove, not from a box, of course, and whipped cream. It's uh, great. And then if you want to, you can put some ch- chocolate curls on the uh, whipped cream. Now, what? as I was thinking about this this morning, I remembered that on Thanksgiving, we always used to get pies from a bakery in East New York in Brooklyn here. Um called Mrs. Maxwell's. I don't know if anybody who grew up in Brooklyn remembers Mrs. Maxwell's, but it was there until COVID. Um, And it had changed ownership sometime in the 1980s. I had a laugh to myself when I read about this this morning. It's now going to be um, uh, apartment house, well, mixed-use building, meaning there are going to be 200 and something apartments upstairs, and downstairs there'll be shops, I suppose, or offices. And uh, I don't know, maybe some other amenities, as they call them these days. And it's a big lot. And what we used to get there was Nestle Road pie. Did you ever eat Nestle Road pie? No. Oh. Well, N- Nestle Road pudding is a real thing, a real French classic. Nestle Road pie, uh, as eaten here in New York City, where I don't know any other place where they, there wasn't Nestle Road pie. I have the whole history of this, by the way, in my book, New York City Food, Arthur Schwartz's New York City Food. I, do I remember all of it? Not really. But I do remember going to Mrs. Maxwell's within the last decade, for sure, because I drove by it all. You come from the from the airport to come to uh, most parts of Brooklyn. You have to go on, along Atlantic Avenue, uh, and at least I did, to get back to Park Slope. So in any case, it's right there on Atlantic Avenue. It's, it was a freestanding building. Uh, it was ripe for some development. And, and East New York is getting built up again with some nice housing. So it was ripe. But... Ten years ago, it was totally not Mrs. Maxwell's. And if you look online about this, they're going to tell you the bakery existed since 1980-something. Well, we were going there in the early 50s. I remember uh, uh, going to my aunt's house in East New York, and we stopped by Mrs. Maxwell's to get pies, uh, chief among them. Uh, Nestle Road Pie. I have a recipe, in fact, for Nestle Road Pie. It's a lost pie. Maybe a decade ago, there was a bakery in Canarsie that still made it and, in fact, got a write-up about it in the New York Times. But other than that, and the, the real Nestle Road pudding is made with chestnuts. The real Nestle Road Pie is not. Uh, unless you want to spring on candy chestnuts to put in it, it gets it gets that those glossed fruits in it, but it's basically a, a, a kind of a Bavarian. But as made at Mrs. Maxwell's and other places as well, it in, in its heyday, it was made into this big dome of Bavarian cream, <laughs> uh, topped with curls of chocolate. Okay, moving on. (laughs) Sounds good. (laughs) Makes me think I have to make one. (laughs) Well, I remember it was was not an easy thing to duplicate. In fact, I I do know that my recipe tells you to mold the the Bavarian cream in a uh, a round-bottomed mixing bowl, and then you have to turn it out into the crust, etc. Um it's a cold thing, but I'm into these cold pies. I mean, you know, it, the expression, it's as easy as pie. Yeah. I never found pie to be easy. <laughs> uh, truly. Um, it, it takes, you know, to make a good crust takes practice. I can do it, but do I want to? Mm, not usually. 
Uh, and I'm all for cookie crusts and graham cracker crusts, uh, which maybe get briefly baked, but you know they're, they're simple. They don't, you don't have to worry about uh, cutting butter into flour um, and making it flaky and crisp. And I mean, there are all these variables that m- can make a pie crust go wrong, whereas nothing can make your cookie crust go wrong. And you'll find zillions of recipes online for these things. I even, I never did this, but the people are into people. You know, it's like I sound like Donald Trump there. <laughs> I hear people are into <laughs> making Oreo, uh, uh, Oreo cookie crusts. And you have to grind up the, the 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 cookies with the cream, and I don't know. Maybe you just pat it into the bottom of a pan. I have to look that up. I'm not a big Oreo guy. So, although it is a common word in the crossword puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> so pie. So besides um, a chocolate pudding pie, in honor of my father, I would also make a banana cream pie, which I love myself. Meaning you just slice up some bananas, uh, put them in the bottom of a crust. Could be a store-bought a graham cracker crust. It's fine with me. Um, if you want, you can make some either vanilla pudding or a vanilla custard. It's a stovetop thing. And pour it over the bananas and then put whipped cream on top. And, that, you know, every slice is going to have banana, custard, and whipped cream with graham crackers. Everything with graham crackers these days, according to my six-year-old great niece, is related to a s'more, and she will try it. <laughs> So anyway, the, right now we're doing prep for uh, uh, Thanksgiving, uh, and I'm not doing recipes especially, but if you are making uh, Thanksgiving, be, be forewarned, it takes a long time to defrost a frozen turkey. And to be safe, you really should do it in the refrigerator, which means you have to make space for, for a turkey for several days. Uh, I mean, you need at least... <sighs> every five pounds a day. So there's nothing much small than a 15-pound turkey. So let's say three days in the refrigerator. You do not want, there is a cold water method you'll read about. It's sort of not recommended by me. For one thing, if you're doing, if you're doing a fast thaw with cold water, you really should change the water every half hour or so. And since it does take a long time to thaw out a 20-pound turkey, uh, that means you're going to be staying up for 10 hours, maybe into the night. Depends on when you put it up. So that's the one preparation you should do. Now, I I mentioned a couple weeks ago, this is the time to, now we can still do it because it's only now getting freezing, harvest sage if you have any in the garden. Because I I love my stuffing or dressing, depends on where it goes, uh, with lots of sage. And in fact, the other I have a bunch of dried sage here, um, only because I do that. Even if I'm not making stuffing, but who knows? They may require me to make stuffing after all. Um, I have a bunch of sage here, and my friend came over. And she said, "This doesn't smell like much." I said, "Believe me, once I start crushing it in my hand, it'll smell plenty." And I use a lot, and I like dried sage. It doesn't have to be fresh sage, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and my stuffing is super basic. Car- uh, um, sorry, celery, onion, sautéed in butter, mixed with croutons of some kind or other, bread of some kind or other, dry bread of some kind or other, um, some broth, and that's it. Salt and pepper, of course. I mean, if you want to make, that's a basic for me. If you want to add sausage, you could do that. If you want to uh, chop chestnuts, you could do that. Well, I've done all that in my life, but right now I only want the starch. <laughs> 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 um, anyway, you, right now is the moment to, if you are going to make a, a, cr- a crouton stuffing, to buy the bread and let it dry out. I, I would buy uh, whatever bread you're going to use. Um, cut it into cubes, uh, put it in a bowl, cover it with a tea towel so it doesn't, uh, nothing lands on it. 
uh, but also gets to breathe and dry out. You could sort of toss it around every couple of days. By the time Thanksgiving comes, or the day before, when you could certainly do this the day before, you will have wonderful croutons. Now, I, there are some bakeries uh, locally around here that package their own bread in crouton form. So I, and I have bought that, and it's really good because I know the bread. Um, the other thing I used to do, and I haven't done this in an age, is make a cornbread stuffing with store-bought uh, corn muffins. And now is a good time to buy those, too. They're really moist, corn, usually corn muffins are. And you may just want to let them dry out a bit um, before you do it. Now, to me, used to be a, a, a stovetop stuffing. Uh, sautéed some onion and uh, jalapeno peppers, uh, in butter, added my crumbled uh, cornbread, tossed it around, uh, a little broth. That was it. That was simple. But you got to prepare for, to have the bread. The other thing is broth. You can make broth right now for your gravy. It makes a huge difference. If you have turkey broth um, that you made yourself to start with, and I noticed in my new ordinary but wonderfully ordinary supermarket around the corner, they were already selling a cut-up uh, turkey wings for making broth. How smart are they? So I would buy a bunch of cut-up turkey wings, or not cut-up turkey wings for that matter, um, and stick them in some water with a carrot, onion, celery. It doesn't have to be cut up, just chunked up. And some salt and just keep on simmering. And if at some point you may have to add some more water, but it's okay. Get all the flavor out of those chicken wings, and you have a nice turkey broth. I, I didn't mean chicken wings. I meant turkey wings. Now, what to do about a first course? To me, that was always a problem. And in the end, I vote for soup. What do you do for a first call? What do you like to have? You buy a fancy turkey, too. I buy, no, you, I know, well, they, they had a dessert turkey farm one year oh. where, where, the burn, where the the barn burnt down when the, when the, it was oh. a hard, I had, some farm in New Jersey. And it became like a ritual for the family to go pick up the turkey, which I thought was a nice thing. Um, but I, 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 every market these days, it seems, carries some kind of nice, fresh turkey, um, you know, organic, free-range. There's a Yiddish expression, hoo-ha. It's sort of like big deal with sarcasm. So I always call them hoo-ha turkeys. You know, they're, they're not just uh, a butterball. Although... So, so I was served a butterball not long ago, meaning within recent memory, and I commented on how good the turkey was, only to find out it was one of those butterballs with with the um, with the pop up uh, gauge that tells you when it's done. I always say it tells you when it's overdone. That's ridiculous. You know. I'm pretty familiar with them. They stink. Those pop up, ter those pop up. Yeah, the pop up things. thing doesn't work, or at least it has never worked for me. It doesn't work. I'll just say that. It doesn't work. Okay. So, but that doesn't mean the turkey is bad. No, no. It just means the pop up is bad. Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, in, if you're desperate, I, uh, which I have been on Thanksgiving Day, having to find some kind of bird. I don't know why, because as I said, I that was never my meal. We went to my aunt when I was a kid, uh, mashed potatoes and chocolate pudding, among other things, of course. She served too much food, my Aunt Pauline, way too much food. And then my sister, she served way too much food. By the time you got through with the appetizers, you didn't want to eat anything else. But um, so I don't, I, I think a first course of some kind of soup, I, I always crave clam chowder. So a small quantity of clam chowder, I always think is a nice opening. But anyway, um, and then um, we went to my sister because I was on the radio from like six in the morning 
until 1 o'clock uh, answering Thanksgiving questions. Like, like it's, it's noon on Thanksgiving Day, and they still haven't defrosted the turkey or even bought one. Of course, the only thing that's left is a butterball. So anyway, um, I don't know what we're going to do now. Since neither of us want to... uh, Oh, I wanted to mention, apropos of Thanksgiving, that for the first time in years, I am seeing Madeira in in the wine shops. Now, Madeira, M-A-D-E-I-R-A, it's the name of the island uh, from which it comes. I've been to Madeira. In fact, one of the places I would go back to in a minute, now, especially now that I don't want to do too much. It's a good place to go if you don't want to do too much. They have nice uh, uh, British hotels on the beach, but it's a Portuguese island uh, in the middle of the ocean off the coast of Morocco. Did you get that? Yep. So Madeira makes a fortified wine that in, in, in the 19th century was super-duper famous in the early 20th century as well. And I wasn't even looking for Madeira now when I found it. Not only did I find it, but I found my local wine store had two different brands of Madeira. Somebody must have, somebody who shopped there must have said, get me some Madeira. Because anyway, I have a recipe for a, um, a, a French pate, uh, actually a terrine, uh, meaning it's baked in a casserole kind of thing. A loaf pan, um, and uh, it, it, I, the, the thing about this recipe is that I loved so much in the old days when I made it was that you marinated the meat in a mixture with Madeira. Anyway, I got this Madeira. I've drunk the whole bottle already. You know, well, not overnight, but um, <laughs> it makes a very good aperitivo, aperitif, uh, or just on its own. It's slightly sweet. Rainwater. There are different levels of sweetness in Madeira, and the uh, not driest, but the, but but not too sweet one, is called rainwater. That's what you would use for cooking as well, because it's not too sweet. Um, anyway, if you're making your own gravy from your own broth, oh, by the way, it's, the bro- it's not just the turkey broth that um, is going to make your gravy, but also using your turkey broth to deglaze the turkey roasting pan so that you get all the little drippings and bits into there and um, and a little bit of Madeira. Madeira. So Madeira is a fortified wine, meaning, I have to explain a little bit, yeast, which makes grape juice into wine, uh, kills itself at 17% alcohol, meaning if there's enough sugar, in, if there is enough sugar in the juice, uh, it will continue to metabolize it until the, the alcohol, which is the byproduct of its metabolism, uh, gets to 17%. And then whatever sugar is left, the yeast dies, and whatever sugar is left in the, if any, or a very small amount maybe, um, is left in the juice, becomes in, in the wine. In the case of Madeira and other fortified wines, a high alcohol product, like kind of brandy, is added to the must before the yeast gets it to 17%, and the addition gets it over 17%. So whatever uh, sugar is left in, in, the, in the juice is still there. I hope I made myself clear. Mm. In the, and the end result is a slightly sweet wine um, that has a higher alcohol content than table wine, but not as, nearly as high as, uh, you know, alcohol, as, as distilled wine, which we call brandy. No, so it's in between. I, I, I didn't even look at the bottle. What happened was I, I lost the cork to the bottle. This, the same minute I, I opened it, I don't know what I did with it. 
So I ended up decanting this Madeira into a decanter so that I could stopper it up. And now I don't know how, what the alcohol content was, but believe me, it was low. It couldn't be more than, I don't know, it couldn't be more than 15%, 20%. So, yeah, probably 20%. Anyway, Madeira. A very good holiday wine for the end of the meal or before the meal. So if you see, if you see Rainwater Madeira, and it's very inexpensive, give it a try. Rainwater Madeira, okay. Rainwater Madeira. I don't know what I have to find out. Maybe it's, it's suddenly become trendy because I suddenly am seeing it in the liquor stores, whereas used to, it, for, for a long time it was impossible to find. It's, by the way, I was, I was thinking about what, how to use this. If you make a, 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 I have a candied yam recipe that calls for um, sweet sherry. So I would use the Madeira instead. It's not sweet. Rainwater's not sweet, but it's got enough sugar that it goes with candied yams. <laughs> <laughs> well, but yeah. then again, so does bourbon. <laughs> I think bourbon goes with. I I, I don't like candy yams, but I had it once when it was made with bourbon. I like those candy yams. <laughs> you know, the, our problem with should we stay home? Should we go out? Should we do this or that? Is that every time I've ever been out for Thanksgiving, I've been anywhere somewhere from disappointed to angered. So yeah, because you always compare it to what you do. That's you why. Know, yeah, but I, it's a lot of work. Yeah. It is. And now we have three different eating modes going on among six <laughs> people. It makes it more difficult. Oh, well, I, I look forward to cooking the turkey, to making the stuffing, and uh, making my gravy because under, when I cook the turkey, I put parsnips, carrots, and potatoes under it. So all the, uh, dri so all the drippings go into that. Uh, and it's unbelievable. It's I bet unbelievable. it is. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Yeah, well, we're not going to get that this year. <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. All right. I, I will undoubtedly report. Well, so we, maybe by next Monday it'll be resolved. It's I was going to say by, before Thanksgiving. By, by next no, Monday, because uh, Brian mentioned that he would love to take his kids to see the balloons getting blown up on Wednesday. Uh -huh. I, I don't know what the weather's supposed to be. Do you have any idea? I think it's going to for 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 the. And we're, yeah, and which it, could it be just, means horrible. Well, and also, the thing that really is bad about that is if it's a windy day, it's a horrible day. If it's not a windy day, you can get by with it. You know what I mean? With the balloon parade for, for Thanksgiving, Macy's Parade. So, Aye. All right. All right. Have a great week, everyone. Prep for Thanksgiving. All right. I'll speak to you next week, Arthur. Uh, Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, here on The Breakfast Club on Robin Hood Radio. Word for Arthur Schwartz, the food maven, Hillsdale Home Chef. More information, 518-325-7000, hgshomechef.com.